In 2017, Intel shocked everyone. AMD were about to shake things up with Zen, a new CPU family that would offer mainstream desktop components positioned to threaten Intel's premium HEDT platform. Intel's shocking move at the beginning of the year was to head off this challenge to their dominance of the high core count market by doing the same thing they always did. Intel's 7000 series of CPUs has always been, to my mind, something of a nothing burger. A small upgrade from the 6000 series CPUs in clock speeds, but without much to offer in terms of IPC gains or efficiency. At least that's based on what I saw in reviews at the time, back when I had an i7-6700K, and rather than upgrade, resolved to wait and see what this Ryzen had to offer. The gaming scene of the time didn't seem to have much need for 8-core processors, but the idea of what could be possible in the future sparked my curiosity. Intel's untimely release of yet another generation of quad cores on the same manufacturing process as the previous two generations only served to throw more fuel on the fire. So why then am I reviewing an i7-7700 today? Well, it's, it's a funny story. I ordered an i7-4930K from my favourite used PC components retailer. To protect their identity, we'll call them Intercourse, but with an edgy X thrown in for good measure. As Intercourse are so prone to doing, they sent me this by mistake. A completely incompatible, different size, different model number, different spec CPU from the one I'd ordered. When something like this happens, which is all too often, I wander up to my local store and return it to them after pointing out their colleague's glaring rookie error and get myself a refund. In this case, however, I wasn't going to look a gift horse in the mouth. I'd paid £35 and received a CPU valued at 100 After ordering a second i7-4930K, which turned up and was in fact the right one this time, I went looking for a good deal on a Z270 motherboard. After all, although I'd been reviewing older CPUs so far, it wouldn't hurt to get some data about how far Intel had progressed from the i7-2600 I reviewed the other week. For testing, I'm using an ASRock Z270 Extreme 4 motherboard with 16 gigs of DDR4 running at 2666 mega transfers a second, slightly higher than the maximum the CPU apparently supports, but about as high as it would allow me to go, and it will be kept cool using a slightly overkill Zalman dual fan tower cooler. As usual, my GPU is the Gigabyte RTX 3070 from my personal rig. Valorant, as we've seen in the past, doesn't care much for thread counts. A quad-core, even one without hyperthreading or SMT, can match a six-core of the same generation in this title, so the KB Lake i7 is in no way disadvantaged next to AMD chips of the era. The 7700 can get close to the magic 240 FPS number, with 1% lows approaching the other magic number of 144. This is an impressive 50% improvement over the Sandy Bridge i7-2600, which, aside from a 200MHz lower boost clock, is about the closest spec Intel chip I've tested so far. It's less impressive when compared to the i5-2500K, and that does make me wonder how much better a k skew chip from this series would perform. In Battlefield 5, the i7-7700 is a night and day difference from everything I've tested up till now. I'm used to Sandy and Ivy Bridge chips, including the Extreme 6 cores, melting into a small puddle on the floor when testing in a 64-player map. Averages aren't the issue, it's 1% and 0.1% scores that are usually the problem, and the area where KB Lake shows a huge improvement. 0.1s are still terrible, but they're terrible on the reference Ryzen 5600X system too. It's not a huge deal. 1%s are an impressive 74 and averages are an equally excellent 136 FPS. Though still a long way from what modern 6 cores are doing, this is a step in the right direction. I have a sneaking suspicion that AVX2 instructions are the key differential, and that's something I hope to test out soon. Fortnite's results are less impressive than I'd have hoped for. With a 217 FPS average and 99 FPS 1% lows, this is about 25% faster than the equivalent Sandy Bridge chip. However, it's only 10% faster than an i5-2500K at 4.5GHz. Still, this is only really a problem when you're viewing a comparison chart. In a vacuum, this is a pretty excellent result and should make all but the most hardcore players more than happy.
Overwatch 2 is still a pretty GPU limited game. I only really keep it on the roster because older CPUs still see comparatively poor frame rates. Full 1440 doesn't really show a meaningful difference between this KB Lake i7 and its Sandy Bridge ancestor, though the extra cores and cache of the HEDT chips are clearly doing something. Dropping scaling to 66%, however, opens up the gap somewhat. The 7700 now matches the 6-core 3960X at over 220 FPS. We're still GPU limited, however, even at a sub 1080p render resolution. When I got hold of an RX 6900 XT last month, it recorded over 300 FPS in this test with Horizon 5 5600G. Spider-Man values a powerful CPU, especially if you're going to attempt ray tracing. With only four cores, the i7-7700 shows itself to be less than ideal for RT in this title, only recording 46 FPS compared to over 70 on a modern 6-core and 54 on an older one. If you're not looking at running RT or don't plan on pairing this CPU with a ray tracing GPU, it can do a stellar job of rendering Manhattan, coming in a shade under 100 FPS and with lows of around 60. For reference, that's about 40% higher than the Ryzen 5 3400G, a CPU that was released over two years later and which I overclocked to 100MHz higher than the i7. Night City is a bit tougher to crack. Without RT, the 7700 can just scrape a 60fps average, way higher than the 50fps sweet spot. Powerful life, baby! Turning on RT sends FPS down into the 40s, with 1% as low as 30. Overall, this is only 10% or so slower than the very extreme i7-3960X and does make me excited to see what a 6-core 14 nanometer Intel is capable of. Luckily for me, I might have one lined up for the near future. In the meantime, however, this quad-core can handle itself admirably in Red Dead Redemption 2, easily matching the old HEDT chips in my ride through Saint-Denis. At 1440 quality, with DLSS bringing the render resolution down to 960p, the 7700 can manage an excellent 74fps in this fairly intensive scenario. Still 15% slower than my Ryzen, but considering that CPU is 3 years newer and has 4 more threads and a 4.6GHz overclock, this is a respectable result. Because Elden Ring caps out at 60fps, the average is less interesting in a modern CPU benchmark. 1% lows become the main way of judging the i7-7700 when compared to something like the Ryzen 5600X, and in that respect it's about 30% slower than the newer CPU. When compared to Sandy Bridge, however, it's a big difference. Those older quad cores had averages in the 40s, whether this huge performance delta was purely down to IPC or instruction sets is something I'll have to work out when I look at Haswell. In the Civ 6 AI benchmark, the locked KB Lake i7 beats the locked Sandy Bridge i7 by two thirds of a second, putting it just ahead of the Ryzen 5 3400G and just behind the overclocked Ivy Bridge 4930K. If it weren't for a happy accident on the part of the retailer, I would never have had the chance to try the i7-7700 in a benchmarking scenario. While I dare say in a side-by-side -side drag race with an i7-6700 there might be some noticeable difference thanks to the newer chip's 200MHz higher boost speeds and faster RAM support, it's most likely not worth the price difference. The Skylake i7 sells for about £75, while the KB Lake fetches a £25 premium that I don't believe is justified. Still, it's useful to know that Battlefield 5's performance problems aren't specific to all quad cores, and it's good to see that there are still some use cases for these once mighty i7s. Would I recommend buying one? Probably not. There's arguments to be made for the i7-6700 or 6700K over this CPU, but the truth is, you're well into the price bracket of a used 6-core Ryzen 3000, new 4000 or even 5000 series CPU, or perhaps an i5-10400 if you're committed to Team Blue. If you already own an i7-7700, I think you're fine for now, but as is the case with all older CPUs I've tested so far, 
I wouldn't get your hopes up about playing RT-enabled games. As for me, I sold my 7700 for slightly below the market rate and still made a healthy profit. Three cheers for set, um, intercourse. Without your mistake, this video wouldn't have been possible. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.